Большое спасибо.
I fear that those who would regulate the Internet are trying to define our future in the terms of our past. We don't know what this future looks like yet. I'll come back to that idea in a few moments. Let me talk for a few minutes about the unintended consequences that can come from regulating the Internet for a good end. We see many attempts to regulate the Internet now under the guise of privacy, piracy, pedophilia, um, security, decency, even President Sarkozy of France would ask us to regulate the Internet in the name of civility. But in all of these cases, I have to ask, why regulate the Internet? Is the Internet broken? It's operating much like it has for 15 years since the web came along. But we find ourselves in a case where I think that these institutions are worried about the effect and the disruption of the Internet on their power. We'll get back to that as well. So on these unintended consequences just in privacy, let me give you a few examples. You go to Germany, where uh, Street View caused a major fuss. And uh, one of the heads of privacy and consumer protection in Germany urged Germans to petition Google to have the images of their homes blurred on Street View. My friends in Germany uh, on Twitter started calling their country Blurmany as a result. I don't know if that joke translates. Um, they also came up with a new word there, the Verpixel Unsrecht, the right to be pixelated. Now, it might sound good that you can tell Google not to take a picture of a building on the street, but on the other hand, it sounds rather silly to me. And the worst part of it is that you've pressured Google into not taking pictures of public views from public places. And when you do that, you diminish what is public. And we, the public, own what is public. When you do that, you affect the free speech rights of others. If, if I tell you you can't take a picture of a, a public street, maybe of the mayor walking into an opium den, well, I've affected your free speech and your right to monitor what happens in public. We had a case in the United States of the police in Chicago, Illinois, arguing that they had a right to not have themselves recorded doing their public duty in public. I find that offensive in an open and public society. We have to be able to maintain the value of what is public. The other problem becomes, in this case uh, in Germany, right it is to control the pictures of the building. Is it the residents? We have cases in Germany where one resident objected, one resident did online. Is it the owner of the building? It's the architect of the building. It's the architect. PIP, isn't it? So that's one example. Another one in the US is what we call COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection. Sounds like certainly a very important thing to do, privacy, and it, indeed it is, but it has had many unintended consequences. It says that children under 13, basically you can't use information online about them, and unless parents have gone through rather considerable efforts to approve this. Well, there's a few unintended consequences. One is that we've learned that we've taught our children to lie about their ages which usually we didn't do until later in life. Um, Dana Boyd, a researcher at uh, New York University, did some research and found that in her sample, children aged 12, under this cutoff, uh, more than half of them had Facebook pages. But what was really important was that three quarters of those pages were started with the help of their parents. So this is a regulation that intended to give parents power the parents not only didn't want to use, but flouted. And, and help their children do what was in fact illegal. But the main problem I have with this regulation is that companies are frightened to serve children online. I know myself because I started some children's sites when I began my work on the internet in the early 90s. And I think what we, the result really of COPPA has been that children are the worst served sector of society online. So. Regulation that comes out of a good heart and a good intention, if not studied, uh, can have unintended consequences. 
In the EU right now, there's a lot of effort to add very strong privacy regulation from Vivian Redding, the Vice President of the European Commission, and I'm troubled by some of what she proposes. For example, she proposes a right to be forgotten. And that sounds good, but as soon as you and I interact with a piece of data, then who owns that data? Is it me or is it you? And if you take a picture of me at a party on the street and put it up and I tell you you must take it down, well, I've now affected your rights of free speech. This is a negotiation that we have to have that isn't as simple as saying that one can have one's life erased online. Vivian Redding also argues for what she calls privacy by default. Well, if we had privacy by default as the law of the land, we would not have such public by default services as Twitter and Flickr, the photo service. That's a problem. Elsewhere in the world, Australia and Canada are looking to filter all content on the internet just to get to uh, child pornography. And of course, that is a very, very important issue, but we have plenty of laws and regulations related to that. We have enforcement related to that. To set the precedent of filtering all content on the internet to get to that one thing, that one crime, affects us all. And it reveals the basic problem here is that when you try to regulate the technology versus the behavior, you have the unintended consequence of affecting many behaviors. Let me say that again. If we regulate technology, regulate the entire internet to get to one behavior we don't like, we also regulate all other possible behaviors that could be there. We shouldn't do that. We should regulate the behavior. That's what laws do. Finally, in the US and in the EU, we have a lot of discussion about do not track regulation. This also sounds good. But the truth is that advertisers have long sold the fact that you read something to advertisers. I mean, I'm sorry, media companies have sold it to advertisers. Um, and I fear that if it became the norm that you cannot place a cookie on a web page to track that user, to know who that user is from session to session, not by name, but just that it's the same user going along, then I fear that we could gravely affect the sustainability, the business sustainability of media. And as a result, we could get less news, less content, less free content, more paywalls. These are just a few examples of the kinds of regulation that are, are being proposed around privacy. And again, there's other regulation around piracy and content. In the US, we had a big fight to uh, beat down the laws called SOPA and PIPA and it really was a war between Hollywood and Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley, I'm glad to say, won. But that's just one of many, many, many wars that are on to <clears throat> protect the net. I'll come back to that idea as well. My problem here is that we're dealing with rather <clears throat> nonspecific fears. Privacy, it turns out, is very difficult to define. It's rather an empty vessel word into which people put their fears. As one author said, privacy means everything and nothing. I, I did a lot of work <clears throat> in my book to try to define privacy and found it very, very difficult. In the end, I came, up, came to this idea, that privacy is an ethic of knowing someone else's information. If I know something about you, if you told me something, it is now public to that extent. What happens to that information now that you've told me is up to me. It rests on my shoulders. So I have to decide whether or not it's in your benefit or to your detriment to share that information. I have to decide why you told me. Did you want it shared? Would it be good for you or bad for you if it was shared? What was the context of you sharing it? All of that decision rests on me because privacy is an ethic of knowing your information. Publicness is an ethic of sharing your information and the good that might come of that. Now let me be very clear here. No one should ever force you to share information. No one should force you to share your private thoughts. But we have to think now that there are benefits to sharing. I talked about my prostate cancer on my blog. That meant that I shared with the world 
the fact that my penis was malfunctioning. What possible good could come from that? Well, I found that I, I had friends and other people who gave me a lot of information and support as a result of that. I inspired other men to get tested for prostate cancer. If you're over the age of 40 or 50, I asked you to do the same. It was my decision and my freedom to be able to share that information and to have good come from it. No one forced me to. No one should force me to. But if I hadn't shared it, if I hadn't gotten one of those men to get tested, what would their fate be? That's a question we need to ask. And I think we have to realize that this discussion is so much about privacy, but it also needs to be about publicness. 845 million have joined Facebook. And of course, many millions more have joined V Contacta. And the reason they're all there is to share. Sharing is a good thing. It's what we want to do in society. It's how we connect with each other. And I think we have to protect that. And to do that, I think we have to argue for the benefits of sharing, and there are many. Sharing creates rela relationships. It improves relationships. It builds trust. It reduces stigmas. Publicness was a weapon in the hands of homosexuals, gays, and lesbians to fight back the bigots who had forced them into a closet. Publicness ends the idea of a stranger because we can meet each other online. It brings out the wisdom of the crowd, witness Wikipedia. It organizes us. It also, very importantly, enables collaboration. If a company and a government are public they, with, with their work and what they do, that opens the door to people collaborating with them. Look at Occupy Wall Street and what occurred there. People gathered around a simple hashtag on Twitter and decided what this idea was, and it spread around the world, and it has a lasting impact. I, I, I can tell you nothing. You can tell me, and I wish I could hear from you, and we're there to ask questions about how the Internet had an impact in your last election and in the protests that could occur. Of course, we have the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was not caused by Twitter or Facebook, but those tools enabled people to find each other. The Internet is a tool that enables people to find, form, and act publics, and that is precious. So I want to end here and talk about the necessity, I think, to leave that freedom wide open. We're at the very beginning of this change. We tend to think that the change we're undergoing is very fast. I now come to think that the change we're undergoing is very slow. I wrote a piece about that for Google's Think Quarterly. Elizabeth Eisenstein, who's a key scholar on Gutenberg, says that the book did not really take on its own form for 50 years after the invention of the press. The impact on society was not fully felt for a century. In that sense, we're at about the year 1472. And a columnist for The Observer in London, John Naughton, asked us to imagine that we're on a bridge in that year in Mainz, where the press was invented. And we asked citizens of Mainz whether they think Gutenberg's invention will cause the disruption of the Catholic Church, fuel the Reformation, spark the scientific revolution, change our definition of education and thus childhood, and I would add, change our notion of nations. Nah, you'd say, a ridiculous, it's just an invention, just a new technology. But I think the internet is that big. I think the change is that vast and that profound. And so I would ask us to be aware of trying to regulate and in fact, define the internet today, when we should be leaving it open for the future. So what I would like to see is a discussion about the principles of an open and public society. And I want to list the ones that I propose in my book. I'd love to have a discussion about others. It's certainly by no means the right list. But I believe we have a right to connect to the internet. Maybe not as far as Finland is declaring that a constitutional right, but if Mubarak cuts off your connection to the internet, is that not a violation of your human rights? Let's get an agreement to that. That leads to a right to speak. And that in turn leads to a right to assemble and act as publics. Privacy, as I said, I think is an ethic of knowing. Publicness is an ethic of sharing. I think we must see that the information from our institutions should become open by default and secret by necessity, especially government, not individuals, 
Companies would be wise to be open, but governments must become open by default. Now they are secret by default and open by force. The government is doing the public's business and must do so in public. We have the tools to do that now. We must insist upon that now. Three more principles. First, what's public is a public good. When you reduce the definition of public, you affect us all. Next, all bits are created equal. If one bit on the internet can't get from end to end, edge to edge, because a government or a company has detoured it or slowed it or stopped it, then no bits can be presumed to be free. And finally, the net must remain open and distributed. That is the architecture of the internet. The very architecture means that no one can control it. No one can claim sovereignty over it. And if anyone does, then it's not the internet anymore. It's not free anymore. So I think we're here today to talk about privacy and society and the internet as well. And I would urge us to not just talk about privacy and about fears, but also talk about publicness and benefits and what we want to defend. So thank you very much. And I now will join the conversation. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Jeff.